Hi everybody, welcome to my first of two videos introducing the Pentax ME Super. The ME Super is an interchangeable lens SLR, and that means that the lenses can come off and different lenses for different effects can be put onto the same body. It has a center weighted averaging meter with shutter speeds from four seconds to one two thousandth of a second. Through the viewfinder, the image is uh, magnified at 0.95x, meaning it's slightly smaller than the actual image coming through the lens. The viewfinder itself has 92% frame coverage, meaning there's a little bit of Im image outside of the frame that uh, is not seen through the viewfinder, but that's okay. It's better to have a little bit of image not seen that you can crop out later than to see more in the actual field. The image as seen through the viewfinder is focused on a split image center ring uh, with micro prism surround and ground glass matte. In the second video we're going to take a look through the viewfinder and you'll see what that means. The flash sync on this camera is 1 125th of a second. This camera was released for the entry level market. It has a manual mode but it's not as easy to control as uh, higher end cameras, so it is really intended by and large to be used as an automatic aperture uh, camera in automatic mode. The You can tell it's an entry level model because it has a simpler interface, fewer bells and whistles, and uh, by default affords the user less control over the image capture process than professional level cameras do. And right now it's set in manual mode here on the M, but most people typically would use it in auto mode because using it in manual mode is a little bit tricky. A little bit harder to do than with, say, a Pentax MX or K1000 or anything, any of those other uh, common Pentax cameras. So uh, this was produced by Pentax from 1979 to 1984 total of about uh, what's five six years in that range uh, exclusively in Japan it was followed by um, Pentax I'm sorry it was preceded by Pentax K series cameras like the K1000 and KM and it was concurrent with the Pentax K1000 and MX and uh, oh it also and it also uh, followed and it followed the Pentax ME and uh, was an upgraded model of the Pe uh, Pentax MV. It, it's actually, so the ME led to this and the MV, and the ME was just a baseline, and then the ME Super was a bit better, and the MV was a bit worse. So this was a little bit concurrent with the MV as well. So next, if you have your instruction manual, you can grab that, but what we're gonna do is go through the camera, take a look at the top, front, um, back, bottom, and inside, and look at all the different buttons and features and how they work. All right, so on the camera, on the, the top, the first thing we have are the strap lugs. They're technically kind of on the front, but uh, what they do is they hold split rings that in this case have leather, uh, leather straps connecting them, or that you can connect your camera strap directly to the split rings. Then over here on the left, we have the uh, exposure compensation dial, which is this dial that goes from, that right now is set at 1x, but you can turn to 2x, 4x, 1 half x, and 1 quarter x. And that's for changing the exposure in your camera on the fly. Uh, and it's a little bit easier to do than, well, it's better for, than changing the aperture because if you change the aperture, you're going to change the depth of field. This allows you to set the aperture at a certain point and then have some control over the shutter speed when you're in automatic mode. Also on this dial is the ASA, also called ISO setting. ISO is the current terminology. ASA is what they called it then. And if you lift the silver ring and rotate, that allows you to, to select your film speed. Right now it's set at 200. This has a, a range of 12 ISO to 1600. So we also have the film rewind knob, which is this knob, and it's also what you would use to open up the back of the camera. And the film rewind crank, which unfolds from the knob and allows you to rewind the film. And we have the little indicator right there, that little orange triangle tells you what your exposure compensation is set to. By default, it should be set to 1x because that is proper exposure. 2x and 4x are 
overexposure, one X and one quarter X are under, I'm sorry, one half and one quarter X are underexposure. Then on top here, we have the flash hot shoe with X sync and the little red X there tells you the type of sync. All modern flashes are X. There used to be others called M and FP, but um, modern flashes are all Xenon. Electronic flashes are also called. So any modern flash you pick up should be able to work just fine with this. The flash shutter speed sync is 1 1 25th of a second. Then over here we have the um, the mode, uh, the control dial. So you push the little white button that allows you to rotate it. Right now it's in lock, meaning you can't take pictures. Then auto mode, which is automatic aperture. So you select the aperture on the lens and then the camera selects the best shutter speed. Manual mode, which allows you to select whatever aperture you want and then the shutter speed you want with these two buttons. 125X, which is a manual mechanical uh, trigger plus your flash sync. So when you're using flash, it's best to set it to 125x because that ensures that your shutter fires at the proper speed. And bulb, or B, which is as long as you hold the shutter down, it, the shutter release down, the shutter will stay open. And that's really good for long duration shots or specialty shots with a flash as well. I'm going to turn this back to the L quickly. There we go. The other thing we have here is this red dot, which indicates your film plane. It's not the typical flip film plane sig uh, indicator, which is a circle with a line through it, but that's, uh, that's what the red dot is for. This is the shutter release button right here, and then this is the film advance lever. So after you take a picture, you just crank the film advance to advance the film to the next frame. And then here is the frame count dial, so it will let, let you know how many photos you've taken. On the front of the camera, go front of the camera on the left here we have the self timer and the self timer is uh, wound by rotating the lever 90 degrees counterclockwise and then you just tap it to start the self timer and it goes for about eight or ten seconds and then it'll take a picture and I'm actually amazed that worked because there's no batteries in this camera right now. So, uh, at any rate, um, the uh, next to that we have the lens mount right here, and uh, this is the lens release pin. So when you want to dismount the lens, you push that in. That that moves that locking pin into the camera body and allows you to remove the the pin or remove the lens rather. In the lens mount. Here's a dot that helps you to line up your lens so you align it correctly. You can see on this lens there's an orange dot in the flange. And all you have to do is pair those up and then you can rotate it. We'll look at that in the second video. And this is the lens's aperture coupling right here, which allows it to, the camera to know what aperture the, the, the lens is set at to adjust metering. This is the flash PC port and this is where you can plug a flash into the camera so that you can have it off the camera body. And this is a really good thing to have because having a flash just in the top in the middle of a camera is about the worst place for it. On the camera's bottom, over here we have the motor winder interface. This is where the motor winder plugs in. What you do is you unscrew this cap and then there's some gears in there. The motor winder connects to that and then automatically advances your film after you take a shot. Here we have the film release pin. We'll take a look at that, what that does in a minute when we open up the back of the camera. This is the serial number right here. Now we've got the tripod bushing on the bottom and the middle. And that's where you screw your tripod in. Here's the battery chamber. We'll take a closer look at the batteries in the second video. This is uh, your motor drive electronic coupling. This allows the camera to control, to communicate with the motor drive to let it know when a picture has been taken so that the motor drive can advance the film. And this hole right here is the motor drive guide pin to help make sure that the motor drive, which has a little pin on it, is aligned correctly when you put it into the camera so that it's not doing damage to the camera by not being um, put onto the body in the proper way. On the camera's back, we have, firstly, the film door. 
and the film door remains shut when the camera's not in use and when there's film in it to prevent the film from being ruined. We also have the memo holder right here. What you do is after you take your film, you tear the flap off the box that the film came in and then you slide it into the memo holder and it'll remind you how many exposure, exposures you have of what type of film so you can make sure your ISO dial is set correctly and also if you set your camera off to the side on a shelf for two weeks or a month, then you can come back and remember, oh, that's right, that's what kind of film I was shooting and that's how far along I am in the roll. So it just gives you an idea of what film is in there. Also lets you know not to open up the back to check and ruin all the film you've already taken. Here's the viewfinder, and the viewfinder is what you would look through to help to compose your image. And around the viewfinder, there are these little grooves that you would slide accessories into, and there are various accessories for different specialty purposes. Inside the camera, what we have over here, this is the film cassette holder, so your film goes in here before you shoot it, and uh, we'll take a look at that in the second video, how to load it and how to know that you've loaded it properly. These four silver rails are the film guide rails, and what these two on the outside do is they keep the film vertically aligned so it's not out of position, and these two inner ones help keep it flat on plane so that the light coming through the lens focuses properly on the film. These uh, leaves are for the vertical travel shutter, and what the shutter does is open and close vertically, not horizontally. There's a slight difference. The vertical travel shutter allows a faster flash sync speed, for instance. And, uh, but this is, it's called a focal plane shutter because it's right in front of the uh, film. This is the film sprocket, and so the film sprocket holes connect to this, and this helps keep the film flat by keeping tension on it, and also um, helps guide it correctly onto the film take-up spool, which is this part right here. And when you can see that this does not rotate backwards right now, the film sprocket, it only rotates forward. Before I rewind film in this, or uh, before you rewind film in yours, for that matter, what you would do is push the button on the bottom that I said we talk about when we looked inside the camera, and now it rotates freely, and that allows you to rewind the film. On the camera's back, we have a film pressure plate right here, and the film pressure plate helps keep the film flat on plane on this part of the camera so that the images are as sharp as possible and then a spring that helps keep the film cassette in place so that it's not putting any kind of bevel or oddly shaped um, uh, uh, odd shapes into the film which would uh, impair focus. So this was one of Pentax's smallest and lightest film SLR bodies. It is incredibly light and it was designed at a time when Pentax was competing with Olympus to make the smallest uh, and lightest possible 35 millimeter body. So to give you an idea of how this compares to a Pentax K1000, this is the previous body style and size used by Pentax. And you can see that the K1000, let me move that off to the side so it's a little bit easier to see, the K1000 is a much taller camera. It's also significantly wider and a little bit chunkier or deeper is probably the best term for it. And it is much, much heavier. Even without a lens, it's much heavier. And compared to an Olympus OM-2, this is an OM-2N, but it's the same body as the OM-2. The, here we go, the ME is just a little bit shorter. It's a negligible difference in, in my opinion, but it's a little bit shorter. It's also, a little bit narrower, but again, not very much, and it's just a little bit thinner, or near as makes no difference the same. So it's a slightly smaller camera, and when you take a look at the top of it, it also has the advantage of not having the wonky Olympus hot shoe. So it is a very, very small, very lightweight camera. It's uh, also an aperture priority camera by default with a manual setting on it. It's a little bit difficult to use. It, uh, the manual mode works also in 1 1 25th of a second, and that's your flash sync in bulb mode. And this has uh, a limited ISO range. Because it's an entry-level camera, it doesn't have as many features as, as the 
pro-level camera, so it's got a limited ISO range of 12 to 1600, as I mentioned, as opposed to pro-level cameras, which might be 6 to 32 or even 6400. So now there's a few things that I want to tell you not to ever do with this camera. The first one is don't touch the shutter. And as you can see, there are some, well, it's hard to see, but there are what appear to be a few fingerprints on parts of the shutter. I think somebody might have touched this at one point. Um, but if you touch it or you put your finger through while it's opened and then it close, closes, that's a really good way to ruin your shutter and brick and otherwise perfect camera. Also, don't touch the mirror inside of the lens mount because your finger oils can take the silver off of it, which will make it hard, if not impossible, to focus and will make the image in the viewfinder a lot dimmer, again, making it even harder to focus. Don't leave your camera and your lenses in your car because you, they'll be heat damaged and what happens is oils that lubricate the camera components can seep into places they're not supposed to be and re-solidify and then your camera won't work properly. Same thing with the lenses. Uh, don't store your gear in a plastic bag or case because you can get fungus when moisture gets into the, the case and it will get into it. You can get moisture and that's going to ruin your camera because the fungus will get in, it'll etch the glass or it'll get into places where it can um, mess up the mechanism. It's very damaging for lenses. Don't let your camera get wet because this is an old camera, it was an entry level camera, it has no weather sealing. And even if it did have weather sealing, at this camera's age I wouldn't necessarily trust it. But it has a lot of electronic components in it that if wet will short out and there is simply no replacing those parts anymore. And the last thing to remember is that your camera is a precision instrument and it should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, it's going to take care of you. And a good camera like this can last a long time. Um, a number of years, as, as, at least as long as they are likely to continue making film. So if this video was helpful, give me a thumbs up. There'll be a second video in the series that you should check out that has some in-depth features about how, or an in-depth look at how to use these features. Uh, if you have any comments, please leave them below. I'm pretty good about reading and responding to those fairly quickly. If you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know. And if I have the equipment and the technical know-how, I'm more than happy to make those for you. And uh, one last, oh, and if you want to subscribe, you can do that by clicking the subscribe button, and you'll be notified when I have more camera and photography related videos that come out. And one last thing, guys, thank you for watching.